subject of our presentation today is um, the Arctic region cooperation or confrontation. Um, the Arctic region has uh, um, raised its profile, one could say, over the last uh, 10 years especially, um, largely uh, on the one side because of uh, global warning, warming and <laughs> global warming and the prospect that uh, the uh, sea route uh, across uh, the north of the um, European continent or the Euro Eurasian continent might be freed and you might have a northern sea route uh, leading from uh, East Asia to uh, the Atlantic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there has been um, an amount of um, um, exploitation of natural resources in the area, uh, especially oil and gas, uh, which perhaps to some extent was dependent on the uh, price of oil uh, being at uh, maybe $120 a barrel, which is not the case today. Um, the um, cooperation such as it is in the area is regulated by the Arctic Council uh, composed of um, uh, Russia, uh, the United States, Canada, Sweden, Finland, Iceland and Norway and there are other groups also. Um, there was a kind of stunt carried out by the uh, Russians in 2007 uh, which involved uh, the placing of a, a titanium uh, flag uh, under the uh, ice cap of the Arctic Ocean, uh, more or less at the North Pole, uh, which has said, uh, set um, heads wagging and uh, speculation rife uh, as to what it imports uh, by way of uh, extension of the continental shelf uh, of Russia. Uh, there is also, of course, um, a wider interest in the Northern Sea Route uh, on the part of uh, China and Japan when you look at the Chinese um, plans for uh, uh, a Silk Road, one belt, one road, I think it's quite understandable uh, that the Japanese might be very interested in an alternative um, via the Northern Sea Route. So all these things have um, made the area of uh, great interest and great speculation in recent years. Uh, which is why we're very happy to have uh, Matty Antonin, uh, the um, Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, of Finland, uh, to speak to us. Um, uh, Mr. Antonin's career has been connected with Russia, with Russia for many years. Uh, he served um, as ambassador to Russia from 2008 to 2012. Before that, worked as Director for Russia and later as Deputy Director General of the Division for Russia, Eastern Europe and Central Asia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, he's not, a, however, a completely one-sided. He has also served in Washington, D.C. Um, and with the permanent mission of Finland to the UN in Geneva. And he told me before we began that uh, some 30 years ago, he studied politics at Trinity College Dublin. So I think uh, nobody better qualified could uh, be invited to speak to us on this very interesting subject. Uh, Thank, you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, and really, really nice to be here in Dublin after so, so many years. As I said earlier, I have a little personal history with this country, having studied in, in Trinity College for one year as an exchange student and also having worked uh, three summers uh, in various places of this country doing voluntary work in Galway, Mayo, uh, north of Dunoak and then also in the south in, in Kilkenny. So I have some understanding of this country but that's over a very long duration. Um, I know that this country has been celebrating its, in a way, hundred years of the, of the Easter Rising, mm -hmm. uh, which then led six years later to the Independence Independent Republic. Uh, next year, Finland will be celebrating its hundred years of uh, being an independent republic, uh, independence for which we have been paying a rather high price. Later on, when uh, 
our eastern neighbor wanted to bring back us to their orbit, which they didn't succeed, but we managed to create a rather working relationship with them then later on. Uh, something which is also uniting us is that we have had a functioning democracy here almost 100 years and in Finland 100 years because many of the European countries, they had to live without democracy at least few years when those countries were occupied by different forces. But Finland has been democracy with ele regular elections 110 years. Already in the Russian period we had a parliament where the women, women, women got the vote and the right to be elected in 1907, first time in Europe. But, but this is not the topic uh, I was supposed to speak about, the uh, Arctic region. Uh, when you think about the region of the world, I think there's of course Antarctica, which is even less talked about, but I think uh, it's a good competitor will be the Arctic region. Not so much in the headlines, it is very remote from most places. Uh, there are very few people, less than 4 million, depending on a bit of the uh, definition what's Arctic. There's very little economic activity as a whole. Uh, and no major transport links go through that area. And what is positive also is that there's, there are no major conflicts in the area. Uh, the just approved uh, global strategy for the European Union foreign and security policy covers Arctic in two sentences. So I think that tells about the, about <coughs> the area quite a lot. Uh, but what makes Arctic interesting at the moment and in the coming decades that all those things I enumerated are going to change. And there's a very one big driver for this change and that's the global warming caused by the climate change. And uh, this will mean that much of the Arctic Sea will be, will be uh, open for navigation. Justin, I want to show you one picture because I don't usually like to show PowerPoint presentations, but sometimes one picture is useful. This is the medium ice for yesterday or day before. 81, 2010. The ice was this big. Now the white is the ice. This is the third smallest amount of ice you have in the north. 2012, there is even less. So, I mean, this is the big change, and it's real. There is no doubt about it. And, you know, this is kind of about the change which is going to happen because it's a real change. and very likely to continue. So let that map be there because maybe I can use it for uh, some later when I show where what the places I'm talking about. But this means that the hydrocarbon and mineral resources will be more available and this will also up open up transport routes between Asia, Europe mainly and this will also change the livelihoods of the people because the nature and the climate will change. It's already changing. Just imagine when you build something on permafrost, it's like rock. When that rock melts away, it will be a very different world. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, the definition of what's Arctic is a bit fluffy. Uh, you know, usually we talk about the area which is inside the polar circle. Uh, then uh, there are, you know, other definitions: the permafrost area, the treeless area in the in the north. But anyway, what even you know, taking into account the different uh, definitions, it's a big area. Only the Arctic Ocean, the big blue thing there, is size of Russia. A bit smaller, but anyway, I mean, if you want the ball, ballpark figure, it's about the size of Russia. Covered by ice the whole winter, and then covered by ice so little in summer. Uh, and in the whole region, less than the population of Ireland. Uh, when we talk about the cooperation, which was referred to earlier in the region, it all started in 91 when Finland invited the, the 
environment, environmental ministers of, of the all, all the eight uh, Arctic countries, Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Soviet Union, Sweden, and the United States to Rovaniemi. And that started the process mainly concentrated on the environmental side, environmental protection, and that led to then uh, 1996 to the establishment of Arctic Council in Otsava 20 years ago. But still much of the work of the Arctic Council is being done in the working group which were founded in, in, uh, in Rovaniemi 91. But what is interesting with this organization, which is an intergovernmental organization, that also the indigenous people are present there as participants, permanent participants. And in addition, there are 12 uh, observers. Uh, the European Union member countries have been pushing very much to get the European Union as an observer so far with no success, but we continue that work. But when we're kind of looking at this region, in, in many ways, uh, from natural geographic point of view, it looks very much the same. But there are actually three very distinct development models in the region. If I start with the kind of what is closest to us and what is smallest one by, by kind of area here, in north of, north of Scandinavia, we have a very different model than they have in North America and Russia. <coughs> we think that there are very few people there, but per square kilometer, we have much more people per square kilometer in northern Scandinavia than in other areas. We have tra democratic traditions. We have uh, infrastructure there, Ra railroads, roads, airports, things. You can reach those areas. And there is quite a lot of economy there. But the share of indigenous people is rather limited. In the whole of Finland, I think we have the Sami people. It's about 10,000 people. Of them, half live in the north, half live scattered in, in, in other parts of the country. Uh, then we have the North American model, mainly in Canada, Alaska. Very low population density. Very little economic activity, mainly the the only economic activity in the region is the oil in Alaska, I mean, kind of sub sub substantial. And very poor infrastructure, hardly existing, and very high proportion of indige indigenous population. In Nunavut, it's almost four, three fourths. In uh, Northwest Territory, half. In, in Yukon, around one, one quarter. And then you have the Russian model, and the Russia, Russia is by far the biggest power in the Arctic. Uh, you have a lot of, several pockets of economic activity, which were developed in the Soviet time. And the Soviet model did not really take economics into account. Because by, if you take the natural conditions, it's very challenging environment, as in North America, but when you don't have to take economics into account, you can do things. <coughs> you can build Norilsk, <coughs> which is producing uh, uh, copper, nickel, palladium, and <coughs> platinum. You have a whole city in the tundra, more than 100,000 people. You know, the, the North American model would not allow that to happen because, you know, ma in market economy, that kind of things do not happen. The environmental cost of these enterprises Norilsk is the second uh, most polluted place in, in, uh, in Russia. The biggest source of uh, stationary non-transport pollution in the country. Uh, and Russia is also present more militarily in the region than the others. And there is a very clear explanation for that because if you think Murmansk, that's the only port where the Russian Navy can get more or less directly to the Atlantic Ocean. If you think the Baltic Sea or the Black Sea, you know, you have the Turkish Straits, you have the Danish Straits, they are much more restricted. Uh, the number of indigenous people in Russian North and the Russian model is, more, is bigger than in, 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 uh, in Scandinavia, but their share is much smaller than in North America. And the economic 
situation of those people is not very good because in a way they are very much part outside those economical pockets which are creating the wealth in the north. But so this is the kind of picture. Some some similarities, but in a way three very different models of development of the region. Uh, I've been dealing with Russia, and I, I start with that because, as I said, you know, it's the most important player. And relatively, the Russian Arctic is much more important to Russia than the Arctic of North America or the Arctic of Finland, Sweden, and Norway. Why? Because Russia is a major producer of oil and gas, as we all know. 90% of Russian gas comes from Yamalo Nenetsia. 90% Russian gas, 20% of world's gas production comes from the Russian Arctic. And there are huge deposits there as well. Uh, half of Russia's uh, oil comes from Hantimansia, which is south of Yamala Menetsia in the middle of western Siberia. So when a country when a country's exports are consisting of oil and gas, 65, 70%, and when the budget income they cover 40% of the budget income, you can understand that this Arctic is important for that country. Uh, the names of the region come from the indigenous people living there, Nenets in the north, and Hanti and Mansi in the south. They're kind of small uh, Fennogric tribes which have been living there, but their share of the population at the moment is very small. Something, if, if Yamala Nenetsi is the biggest uh, gas producing region in the world, it's also the region with the highest number of reindeer in the world. So kind of, if you can talk about dual economy, that's a dual economy. You have reindeer, and then you have a super modern production of gas in a massive scale. Um, but this is kind of a challenging strategy when, when the country is so dependent on oil and gas I think this year's most interesting uh, lecture I've heard was uh, took place in London uh, earlier this year during the EBRD annual meeting when I had the opportunity to listen to uh, Sir Nicholas Stern, which is a really well-known climate economist. And I think he put it in a very concrete and w good way that if we take these two, two centigrade limits seriously, that the cl global climate would not uh, heat up more than two, per uh, two degrees, 70% of the world's known coal, gas, and oil reserves have to stay where they are. Okay, and then we have a country which is so dependent on oil and gas. And I think the big question coming out of uh, Sir Nicholas's presentation is that who Whose 30% will be sold to the markets before you know this 70% has to stay? Because you know it's it's purely arithmetics that you know there's a X number of tons coal there, and if you let that to the to the air, you know if you burn everything, you're clearly by far over this two two per two degrees centigrade. Uh, so this is a big challenge for Russia and it's somewhat kind of related to their Arctic strategy. At the moment there is very little uh, transport on this. This is the so-called uh, Northeast Passage and this is the Northwest Passage going through the Canadian uh, Arctic Alarmo. This Northeast Passage cuts the journey between Yokohama and Rotterdam by one third. Between Shanghai and Rotterdam by 25%. We can all understand what it means if that would be navigable for a long period. Much shorter uh, distance between the major trading partners. And what is happening now is that uh, Russia is building the first ever big LNG facility here on Oak Bay, which is on the kind of still covered by ice, according to the Americans. Uh, and it will mean that they will be transporting that gas to the Asian markets 
summertime using the Northeast Passage. First time ever this sea route is being used for massive amount of uh, export of, of hydrocarbons. It's not yet there. People have not noticed it. But because much of the equipment is being manufactured in Finland, we know that it's going to take place. It's going to be a reality. And in a way, it will be, it will be kind of changing many things in the region. Of course, in a way, it's safe to transport LNG because that's not an environmental hazard the same way you are transporting oil because, you know, it's methane. And the worst thing which might happen is that methane kind of evaporates in the air, but it doesn't pollute the sea. But it will change the whole map of the world's uh, kind of thinking about the north. Uh, and there will be a couple of other oil and related terminals which will be built in the, in the neighborhood of this, this port. Uh, and there are also these uh, mineral deposits in, in Norilsk which is, here is a uh, Yenisei, it's a big river comes here, and it's, it's near the mouth of Yenisei, there's Norilsk, which is the, probably the world's uh, kind of richest deposit of, uh, of minerals, because it's still very profitable to exploit that, even if you have the whole city to manage uh, <coughs> and to pay for. Uh, Something which is concerned to us is that the Russians have similar kind of not very clean production facilities in our neighborhood in, in, uh, in uh, Kola Peninsula. The situation has improved during the years, but there's a long way to go before they are reaching the Nordic environmental standards. And, and you can see that from the surroundings of these, of these plants, so on a moonscape. Something we have to remember is that Russia's history is full of these mega projects. My question to, to my Finnish uh, younger colleagues is that what is the biggest ever mega projects of this kind? And it's the city of St. Petersburg. It's a bog in the end of Gulf of Finland, the most inhospitable, horrible place to build the city of five million inhabitants. But Peter the Great said, it's going to be here. And I forbid building any stone buildings anywhere else in Russia than here. And he brought the workforce and he built the city. And now it's there and it won't move away. But the place was not a very good one. You have Sochi Olympics. The railroad and the road connection to the mountains cost hundred million euros a kilometer. Five billion euros. We, can, we can't afford that kind of things, but Russia can. And that's the way the country has been developed during the, you know, history. But, you know, it's, it's useful to remember that it's not something for the present Russia. It has been the tradition. But somebody in, in Kremlin or St. Petersburg decided, let's, let's build a railroad to, to Pacific. And then it continues. But of course, with that kind of management system, you cannot handle many of these things. So there's a limited amount of, of these projects which can be done at the same time. But when we kind of jump to the other side of the Atlantic, to North America, this type of a kind of action is not possible. You have to take uh, uh, money into account. and. Uh, if you think of the North American kind of economic history, both Alaska and uh, northern part of Canada, they were part of these gold, gold rushes around 100 years ago. That was the kind of the first time we heard about Alaska and, and Yukon, for example. Then I think the next stage was about 70 years later when Alaskan oil was developed and the pipeline was built. During the last decade with the, with the boom in the, in the commodity markets, we had few small projects which had, were mature enough to be realized, like one on the Baffin Island, here. This is Baffin Land. And there is an iron mine in the middle of the northern part of Baffin Land, which was you know, developed 
during the last decade and now is up and running. Uh, but nothing major new happened there in that part of the world. There's one big project going on in northern Alaska to produce gas and then ship it to the south make it into LNG and, and ship that to the markets in, in Asia, but it's most likely that it will be realized. It will take at least 10 years. So North America with these commodity prices will look quite, quite silent compared to the Russian North. One challenge, our two challenges which they have, I was in Canada whole week last June, and if I had to pinpoint two things important for the country, how to develop infrastructure, which is really lacking, no rail railroads, no roads, no electricity networks, uh, very few ports, very few airports, at least big ones, the number one question, and the number two question, how to provide meaningful employment for the indigenous people in those conditions, and taking into account that it's a market economy. Nothing, not the easy thing to do. Maybe a few words about Norway, because Norway used to be a country as poor as Finland 100 years ago. If there are four countries in Europe which lost, I mean, the, if, you, if you count the countries which lost most people in, in immigration, it, number one was Ireland, number two was Scotland, number three was uh, Norway, and number, five was, uh, number four was Sweden. I mean, those countries were not so wealthy 100 plus years ago. Important <coughs> to remember. Uh, anyway, it's an oil country again, but a different kind of oil country than Russia. And their oil production is shifting from the North Sea to the Barents Sea. And they have managed to negotiate with Russia a new border treaty which allows this to happen because when, when there's a clear border in the sea between the parties, you can sell licenses and the companies can operate there. And in the last licensing round, in spite of the low oil prices, all the licenses were taken and there will be a lot of exploration activity in the Norwegian north. On the Russian side of the border, the EU and US sanctions they have had their impact because, you know, Arctic uh, oil exploration is one of the sectors which have been restricted. And the role of the foreign companies has been major in those projects because Russia has very little own experience in producing oil and gas in the Arctic, Arctic offshore. Arctic onshore, they are very big, but Arctic offshore is something new. They have actually only one Prilas Lomne field, which has been operated by, by Gazprom Neft for a while, but it took more than 10, 15 years to build. And there are huge, already known hydrocarbon reserves, like the huge Stockman field, which is in the middle of the Barents Sea here. If you think of, kind of compare that to the Finnish gas consumption a year, it would fulfill Finnish gas consumption for 700 years. So it's big, but it's going to be there because there are no technological solutions which would be kind of uh, economical enough to make, make that a profitable. Uh, so many things might be staying in the ground in the north if we take this Nick Stern's 70% seriously. As said, here earlier, this shrinking ice has made this area also interesting for those parties which are not coming from the region. China, South Korea and Japan especially. Because for them, if they can get so much faster to the European markets, it's good economically and ecologically. Uh, as I said, it's at the moment mainly theory. After this big LNG facility and the regular traffic, we'll see how real it is. The conditions are very tough, even in summer. Uh, 
we need much better a much more reliable weather and ice forecasts in the region we need navigational aids we need search and rescue if something happens you can just imagine if a big cruise liner you know something happens on a cruise liner and uh, you have 2000 people stranded somewhere there it will be a major catastrophe we can we can you know still tell, tell our own story because in 1994 a major ferry ship Shank, sank in the Gulf of Finland and it brought down 800, 900 people. And it happened in Gulf of Finland, which is not big, it's not kind of big ocean, but the conditions can be really tough. Uh, and as a whole, we need much more research in order to make the better use of uh, natural resources possible and also the understanding the impact of the climate change because in the arctic region we are talking about adaptation the world's climate will not be saved there the world's climate will be saved in china in 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 india in the united states in europe where the emissions are north will be just they have to adapt because the climate change is about is, is kind of estimated to be twice as fast in the north <coughs> as, than on the average so if we are talking about two, per, 2 centigrade average warm heating globally, it means 4 to 5, per 5 degrees in the north. And that's, that's, that's really a lot. Uh, then it was also mentioned that, of course, because you know, the opening up of the opportunities, there's new attempts to claim sovereignty over larger parts of the, of the ocean. And as mentioned the best publicized stunt was the placing of this uh, of this uh, russian flag at the north pole <coughs> using a small submarine something something finnish in this story was that the submarine was built in finland in <laughs> 1980s we got the permission from the americans to to deliver that kind of ship to the soviets because the americans did not believe that we could make it <laughs> When we made it and sold it, they were not so <laughs> happy about it. But you know, that was a that was a done deal. There are actually two of them, and they played an important role when when uh, filming Titanic, because they can go really deep, and there are not many of them in the world. Because again, that was not the market economy. You could pay anything for that kind of thing, and develop that kind of thing with you know, no costs uh, thought about, and. Uh, so probably it was a good, good deal for this company as well. Uh, but that Russia is not only country claiming uh, territory there. Both Denmark and Russia, and Russia and, and uh, Canada have over, overlapping claims around the North Pole. Not big, but clearly <coughs> overlapping claims. Denmark thinks that this belongs to them, Canada thinks this belongs to them, and Russia thinks this belongs to them. But luckily, it's very far in the north, and using that area for any economic activity in the coming years, even with the climate change, is very unlikely. Most likely, it will be covered by ice for the next 20 years anyway, all year round. And what is positive is that uh, all the countries, coastal countries, have agreed uh, to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and to the orderly settlement of any possible overlapping claims. So sounds much better than in many other parts of the world where this orderly settlement is not really very orderly. Uh, Norway has got this recommendation from the UN, UN body responsible for this convention. Uh, Denmark, Russia and Canada are still waiting for their <coughs> responses. They have submitted their, their cases and, and they are now waiting for the uh, recommendations and then on the basis of these rec recommendations the countries have to delimit, delimit their uh, ex exclusive economic zones and, and then agree with others because the same place cannot be in, in two exclusive zones but I don't think that is very like I don't think it's very likely that this will lead to major uh, territorial issues between the parties uh, a few words about the military side of the of the region because it's, it tends to be a kind of fashionable theme to talk about you know raising military tension all over the world, including the Arctic. 
the EU strategy I mentioned at the beginning says that sets as a goal that the Arctic region region should remain a low tension area. So I think they implied that it's it is a low tension area and it should remain. Uh, the Arctic cooperation, which we are handling in the side of the uh, in in the in the Arctic Council, we are not talking about politics. We try to concentrate on the on the research, on the environmental questions, on sustainable development of the region. But this growing tension in Europe between the United States, European Union, and Russia has not led so far to any problems in the functioning of these bodies working in the north. Interesting, interestingly enough, last year in August and in October, we found it together in the framework of the Arctic Council uh, Coast Guard, Arctic Coast Guard Forum, where the Russian FSB is the Coast Guard for Russia. Uh, so, why this? Because we have two binding agreements concerning uh, search and rescue and oil spills, fighting oil spills, and without the work of the Coast Guards, this is meaningless. You need the Coast Guards to work on these matters, otherwise these problems cannot be solved. And in a way, as I said, it's good that we have been able to continue this cooperation because it's needed. As said earlier, Russia has by far the largest military presence in the area, uh, but the military build-up has not been so massive as people think, and as, at least if you compare to the, to the presence of Soviet military, we are still far from that. Some new installments have been built, and some old bases have been uh, uh, brought back to life, but generally, we are very far from the Cold War, time, Cold War times. Uh, also, the other countries have uh, increased their interest on, some, on the military side, or at least start, stopped the decline in the region. But we are not really talking about the major investments. Uh, I think more kind of the, uh, we, can, we can state that uh, the countries have stopped cutting their military capabilities in the north. And of course, these other forces are not comparable to the Russian capabilities. But as I said, you know, the Russian interest in the region is by far bigger because it's the heart of their economic strength. Uh, maybe a, in the end, a few, few words about Finland. We will be taking over the chair of the Arctic Council from the United States, and it will be in our hands for two, two years. 2017-2019 spring. We'll, we will be continuing the work started by the Americans. In environment, sustainable development and research continue, be, continue to be in focus. There will be some new additions. We are at the moment discussing with other parties of the Council what should be the priorities the next two years. Uh, why it's important region for us because our industries are much involved. Arctic business is not a mega business, but for Finland it's probably relatively more important than for any other EU country because we are a major provider of technology for all those things you need in the north. Uh, for example, those uh, LNG carriers transporting the gas, all the propeller systems are made in Finland and all the engines are made in Finland and they have been designed in Finland and they're being built in, in, North, in, in South Korea. Uh, our research community is heavily involved in both climates, ice and meteorolo meteorological work in the Arctic. Uh, we want to know how people could work there, because with the increased economic activity, there will be more people working there, and we want to secure their safety and well-being when they are working in these tough conditions. Because Tough conditions they will be, even if it's going to be less ice in the region. And paradoxically, the less ice there is in the region, the more capabilities and competencies you need to work in these conditions, because that will lead to increased activity. So, in a way, people have to know more about ice 
and those very difficult conditions. Uh, we are rather confident that this positive uh, kind of cooperative uh, mood will prevail in the north and in spite of the tensions in other parts of the Europe, we don't see a major prospect for confrontation in this region. So thank you very much and uh, I'm more than ready to answer for questions.